This is part two of chapter one of Liev Gumilyov's Ethnogenesis and the Biosphere. Formations and Ethnoi. If, however, we look at all world history, we will note that coincidences of changes of formation and the appearance of new peoples are only rare exceptions, while ethnoi, very dissimilar to one another, constantly arise and develop within a formation. Take the example of the 13th century, when feudalism nourished the, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The French barons were hardly like the free peasants of Scandinavia, the slave warrior Mamluks of Egypt, the unruly population of the Russian Vish towns, the indigent conquerors of half the world, the Mongol nomads, or the Chinese landowners of the Song Empire. Common to them all was the feudal mode of production, but little else. Agriculturalists and nomads' attitudes to nature did not coincide. Receptivity of things foreign, or capacity for cultural borrowings, was higher in Europe than in China. No less than the striving for territorial conquests that stimulated the Crusades. Russian slash and burn agriculture was simpler and more primitive than the viticulture of Syria and the Peloponnese, but yielded a fabulous harvest with less expenditure of labor. Languages, religion, art, education were all unlike each other, but there was no confusion in this diversity because each style was the property of a definite people. It should not be thought, however, that the degrees of ethnic individuality is determined only by nature. Centuries passed and the relations of ethnoi changed, some disappearing, others appearing. It is accepted in Soviet ethnography to call that process ethnogenesis. The rhythms of ethnogenesis are coupled in world history with a pulse of social development, but the coupling does not mean coincidence, let alone unity. History is a single process, but its factors are different, and my task, i.e. analysis, is to single out the phenomena directly inherent in ethnogenesis, and so to clarify what an ethnos is and what its role in the life of mankind. It is necessary to start with to agree on the meanings of the terms and the limit of the investigation. The Greek word ethnos has many meanings in the dictionary, of which I have chosen one, species breed, implying by that, people. There is no point for my posing of the theme in singling out such concepts as tribe or nation, because I am interested in the common denominator. In other words, the general that exists among Englishmen and among Maasai, among ancient Greeks and modern gypsies. This is the property of the species Homo sapiens, to group together so as to counterpose themselves and theirs, sometimes close but often quite remote, to all the rest of the world. This singling out is characteristic of all epochs and countries, Hellenes and barbarians, Jews and the uncircumcised, Chinese, people of the Middle Kingdom, and who, the barbarian periphery, Russians included. Muslim Arabs in the time of the first caliphs and infidels, Catholic Europeans in the Middle Ages, the unity called the Christian world, and godless, including Greeks and Russians, Orthodox in the same period, and unbaptized, including Catholics, Tuaregs and non-Tuaregs, Gypsies and all other people, etc. This opposition is a universal phenomenon which indicates its deep foundation, but in itself it is only the foam on a deep river, and I have still to bring out its essence. But the observation already made is enough to attest to the complexity of the effect, which can be called ethnic, in the sense stock or breed, and which can be taken as an aspect for constructing an ethnic history of all mankind. My task is therefore, first of all, to find the cause of this process. There is an undoubted link between ethnic history and geography, 
but it cannot exhaust the whole complexity of the relationship of the diverse phenomena of nature and the zigzags of history of ethnoe. Further, the thesis, any attribute by which ethnoe can be classed is classified as adaptive to a concrete environment. This thesis reflects only one aspect of the process of ethnogenesis. As Hegel wrote, the mild ionic sky certainly contributed much to the charm of the Homeric poems, yet this alone can produce no homers. Footnote 11. However, when an ethnos that has taken shape in a definite region where adaptation to the terrain has been maximum migrates, it retains many of the original features that distinguished it from the aboriginal ethnoi. The Spaniards who settled in Mexico, for example, did not become Indians, Aztecs or Mayas. They created an artificial micro-landscape for themselves, towns and fortified haciendas, and preserved their culture, both material and spiritual, in spite of the fact that the moist tropics of Yucatan and the semi-deserts of Anhuac were very different from Andalusia and Castile. But the separation of Mexico from Spain in the 19th century was largely the work of the descendants of Indian tribes that had adopted the Spanish language and Catholicism, but that were supported by the free tribes of the Comanche who had migrated north of the Rio Grande. Let me now draw a first conclusion, which will be the starting point for further exposition. The mosaic anthroposphere, which has been constantly changing in historical time and interacting with the topography of planet Earth, is nothing else than an ethnosphere. Since mankind has spread everywhere, though unevenly over the surface of the land, and always interacts with Earth's natural environment, but differently. It is sensible to treat it as one of Earth's envelopes, but with an obligatory correction for ethnic differences. So I am introducing the term ethnosphere, which, like other geographical phenomena, must have its own patterns of development, different from the biological and the social. Ethnic patterns are observable in space, ethnography, and in time ethnogenesis, and the paleogeography of the anthropogenic landscape. Can one trust the historical sources? Yatsunsky, the author of fine surveys on the geographical thought of the 15th to 18th centuries, justly remarked, historical geography does not study the historical ideas of people of the past, but the concrete geography of past centuries. Footnote 12. The initial data for this quest obviously have to be sought in the historical works of past ages, but how? Unfortunately, there are no pointers to a possible method of research, and here's why. Historical materials, as sources for the reconstruction of ancient climatic conditions, have been and are employed very widely. A famous polemic developed on this plane between Berg, footnote 13, and Grum Grismilo, footnote 14, on the desiccation of Central Asia in the historical period. They tried to solve the problem of the fluctuations of the level of the Caspian Sea in the first millennium AD associated with this question by selecting citations from the works of ancient authors. Special digests of information from Russian chronicles were made so as to draw conclusions about the change in Eastern Europe's climate. But the results of the numerous laborious studies did not come up to expectations. The information of the sources was sometimes confirmed, but tests by other ways sometimes refuted them. Hence it follows that the coincidence of the data obtained with the truth was a matter of chance, which suggested that the method was defective. In fact, the method of simple references to the evidence of an ancient or medieval author leads to a false conclusion, or at best to an inexact one. And so it should. The chroniclers either mention phenomena of nature among others, or, starting from the ideas of the science of their time, treated storms, floods, and droughts as omens or punishments for sins. In both cases, the phenomena were described selectively. When they came into an author's field of view, and we cannot even guess how many got left out. One author would draw attention to nature, but another in the next century did not. 
and it could turn out that the rains were mentioned more often in a dry time than in a wet one. The historical criticism is unable to help here because it is powerless as regards omissions of events not linked by a casual causal dependence. Ancient authors always wrote their works with a definite purpose and, as a rule, attached exaggerated importance to events that interested them. The degree of exaggeration or belittling is very difficult to determine and it is not always possible. So Berg concluded from historical works that the conversion of cultivated land into desert was a consequence of wars. That idea is now taken without criticism. P.K. Kozlov's find, the dead city of Tang, the dead Tangut city of Yihinjai, known as Harahoto, footnote 15, is often cited as an example. This is so significant a point that I shall concentrate attention on one problem, the historical geographical location of this city and the conditions of its death. The Tangut Kingdom was located in the Ordos and the Alashan, in places where there are now sandy deserts. This state, it would seem, was poorly and thinly populated, but in fact it maintained an army of 150,000 horsemen, had a university, an academy, schools, a legal procedure, and even a trade deficit because it imported more than it exported. This deficit was covered in part by gold dust from its Tibetan possessions. The main export was live cattle, which, consti which constituted its wealth. The city dis discovered by Kozlov lay in the lower reaches of the Edzin Gaul, in a locality now uninhabited. The two oxbow lakes that surround it on the east and west indicate that there used to be water, but the river changed course to the west and now falls by two arms into lakes. A salt one, Gashonor, and a fresh one, Sogonor. Kozlov described the valley of the Sogonor as a freshwater oasis in the desert surrounding it, but noted at the same time that it could not feed a large population. But the citadel of Har Harahoto alone is a square with sides of 400 meters, and there are traces of lesser structures and fragments of ceramics that indicate the existence of handicraft suburbs. The destruction of the city is often ascribed to the Mongols. In fact, Genghis Khan took the Tangut capital in 1227, and the Mongols brutally made short work of its population. But the city discovered by Kozlov continued to exist still in the 14th century, as is attested by the dates of the many documents found by members of the expedition. Then the end of the city was linked with the change in the river's course, which was diverted by the besiegers, according to Torgod folk tradition, by means of a dam made of sandbags. The dam has survived to the present in the form of a wall. So, it seemingly existed, but the Mongols had nothing to do with it. In the descriptions of the capture of the city of Uruhai, Mongolian, or Sichuan Chang, Chinese, there is no such information. And it would simply have to have been impossible since the Mongol horsemen were not equipped with the necessary trenching tool. The death of the city was ascribed to the Mongols by an evil tradition that began back in the Middle Ages of ascribing everything bad to them. In fact, the Tangut city perished in 1372 and was captured by Chinese troops of the Ming Dynasty, who were then waging war against the last of the Genghisites, and was laid waste as a base of Mongols who were threatening China from the west. But why didn't it revive? The change in the river's course was not the reason, since the city could have migrated to another tributary of the Edzin Gaul. An answer to that can be found in Kozlov's book. With the powers of observation characteristic of him, he noted that the amount of water in the Edson Gaul had got less, and that the lake Sogonor had grown shallower and overgrown with reeds. The shifting of the riverbed to the west had played a certain role in that, but it alone could not explain why the country had fed a huge population in the 13th century, but had been converted into a sandy desert at the beginning of the 20th. So the blame for the desolation of the cultivated land of Asia does not fall on the Mongols, but on changes of climate, which I have described in special works. Footnote 16. K. 
Can we believe the memorials? But why were Genghis Khan and his sons blamed for the devastation of Asia, while other events of a much greater scale, for example, the defeat of the Oghurs by the Kyrgyz in A.D. 841 to 846, or the extermination of the Kalmyks by the Manchurian Emperor Qianlong in 1756 to 1758, footnote 17, have remained outside historians' field of view? The answer has to be sought in historiography rather than in the history of peoples. Talented books on history are not often written, in any case, and besides, do not all come down to us. In the Near East, the age of the 14th and 15th centuries was a period of the flowering of literature, but the struggle against the Mongol yoke, both in Persia and in Russia, was then the most pressing problem, and a host of works was devoted to it that have survived to our day. Among them were both talented and brilliant works, judging by those that have come down to us. They evoked imitations and repetitions, which increased the total number of works on this question. The extermination of the Oirats did not find its historian, or he perished in the massacre. Thus, it turned out, events were not illuminated uniformly, and their significance was distorted, since they were presented, as it were, on different scales. Hence, too, a hypothesis arose that ascribed the almost total annihilation of the population of lands conquered by Genghis Khan and the complete alteration of the landscape to his hordes, which by no means corresponds to the truth. It should be noted that the maximum desiccation did not occur in countries ravaged by the hordes, but in Uguria, where they were not at all, and Jungaria, where, there, where no one decided to destroy the grassy steppe land. The historical and geographical information of the sources is consequently unreliable. And finally, it is tempting to consider tremendous historical events, like the Mongols' campaign of the 13th century, as migrations. The eminent British scholars Ellsworth Huntington and C.E.P. Brooks, for example, yielded to this temptation. But the Mongol campaigns were not associated with migrations. The victories were not won by crowds of nomads, but by smallish, beautifully organized, mobile detachments that returned to their native steppes after the campaigns. The numbers on the move were insignificant even for the 13th century. The Khans of the Juchid branch, for, example, for instance, Batu, Orda, and Shaiban, received by Genghis Khan, will only received by Genghis Khan's will only 4,000 horsemen, i.e. around 20,000 persons, who were settled over a territory from the Carpathians to the Altai. The real migration of the Kalmyks in the 17th century, on the contrary, remains unnoted by most historians because it did not have great resonance in works of world history. Consequently, a more solid knowledge of history is required in order to tackle the problems posed than what is readily derived from summary works, and a more detailed knowledge of geography than to which historians or agricultural economists usually limit themselves. The main point is that it is necessary to extract reliable information from the subjective perceptions characteristic of many authors of written sources, from Herodotus down to our day. We are well acquainted with the dates and details of battles, peace treaties, palace revolutions, and great discoveries, but we do not always know how to link these data up with definite phenomena of nature. The method of comparing the facts of history and changes of nature only began to be developed in the 20th century. Leroy Ladurie, the historian of climate, has noted that the tendency to reduce booms and slumps of the economy in the various European countries to periods of increased or lowered precipitation, cooling or warming, was based on an ignoring of economic and social crises, whose role was not doubted. He thus considered that the increase in imports of Baltic, i.e. Russian, grain into the Mediterranean, and reduction of the number of sheep in Spain in the 16th and especially 17th centuries are more easily correlated with the destruction inflicted on European countries by the Reformation and Counter-Reformation than with insignificant changes in annual temperatures. Footnote 18. He is right, 
Suffice it to note that there was a fall in population in that century, not only in Germany, whose territory was devastated during the Thirty Years' War, but also in Spain, a country that did not suffer ravages. In 1600, 8 million persons, and in 1700, 7,300,000 persons. But that was due to a large part of the young men having been mobilized in America or the Netherlands, as a consequence of which there was not enough working hands in the country to maintain the economy and families. What would we think of a historian who undertook to explain all the economic progress of Europe since 1850 by the retreat of glaciers established beyond doubt in the Alps? Ladouri wrote, footnote 19. It is impossible not to agree with him. It is consequently necessary, in his opinion, simply to amass facts dated as accurately and unambiguously as possible so as not to encourage contradictory interpretations. There is no exact method of determining absolute dating in geography. A mistake of a thousand years is considered quite acceptable in it. It is easy to establish, for example, that deposits of silt have covered strata of loams and consequently to note the existence of flooding. But it is impossible to say when it happened 500 or 5,000 years ago. Pollen analysis indicates the existence, for instance, of xerophilus, drought-tolerant, plants in a place where moisture-loving ones now grow. But there is no guarantee that the swamping of a valley occurred because of a shifting of the channel of a nearby river and not through a change of climate. Remains of groves have been discovered in the steppes of Mongolia and Kazakhstan, but it is impossible to say from them whether they died out from desiccation or from being chopped down by people. Even if the latter was demonstrated, the time of savage treatment of the landscape would still remain unknown. Perhaps archaeology can help. Memorials of material culture distinctly mark periods of the flourishing and decline of peoples and are amenable to quite accurate dating. The things found in the ground or old burials do not tend to mislead researchers or inspire them to distort the facts. But things are mute which gives the archaeologist plenty of scope for imagination. And our contemporaries are also prone to romance and to let their imagination run away with them. And although their way of thinking is very different from the medieval one, there is no certainty that they are any closer to reality. In the 20th century, we sometimes meet blind faith in the power of archaeological excavations, based on the truly successful finds in Egypt, Babylonia, India, and even in the Altai Mountains, thanks to which we have been able to discover and investigate forgotten countries of ancient history. But that is the exception. For the most part, the archaeologist has to be satisfied with shards got from the dust of scorching steppes, fragments of bone and rifled graves, and the remains of walls, the height in one imprint of a brick. And one must remember, moreover, that the find is an insignificant part of the lost. It is never known what precisely is lost, but it is a mistake to consider the lost non-existent and not to make allowances for it, a mistake that leads to obviously incorrect conclusions. In short, archaeology without history can lead the researcher into error. Let us try otherwise. Are there ethnoi? There are no signs for defining an ethnos. According to my suggested definition, the form of the existence of the species Homo sapiens is a collective of individuals opposing themselves to all other collectives. It is more or less stable, although it arises and disappears in historical time, which constitutes the problem of ethnogenesis. All these collectives differ more or less from one another sometimes in language, sometimes in customs, sometimes in the system of ideology, sometimes in origin, but always in historical fate or destiny. An ethnos is consequently, on the one hand, a product of history, and on the other is linked, through productive activity or the economy, 
with the biokinosis of the landscape and country in which it was formed. Consequently, an ethnic national group can change its relation, but with that it is altered beyond recognition, and continuity is only traceable by scientific method, with the strictest criticism of sources because words are deceptive. Before I go any further, we must agree on the concept of ethnos, which I have not yet defined. We do not have a single real attribute for defining an ethnos as such, although there has never been and is not a human being who is unethnic. All the attributes listed define an ethnos sometimes, but their aggregate defines nothing at all. Let us check this thesis by the negative method. In the theory of historical materialism, the basis of society is recognized as the mode of production, which develops through socioeconomic formations. That is why self-development plays the decisive role in it. The influence of erogenous factors, that should be the influence of exogenous factors. We'll, uh, we'll blame the text on this. This is very strange. The influence of exogenous factors, including natural ones, cannot be in the genesis of historical uh, social progress. The concept society signifies an aggregate of people united by the concrete historical conditions of material life common to them. The main force in this system of conditions is the mode of production of material goods. People are united in the course of production, and the result of this uniting is social relations, which are formed in one of the five known formations, primitive communal, slave-owning, feudal, capitalist, and communist. It is impossible to be united in an ethnos, since members of one ethnos or another is directly perceived by the subject himself, and the surrounding ones take it as a fact not subject to doubt. Feeling or sensation consequently underlies the ethnic diagnostic. A person belongs to his ethnos from infancy. It is sometimes possible to incorporate strangers but if that happens on a broad scale, it disintegrates the ethnos. An ethnos can be broken up, but it is preserved in a diasporic state, forming numerous relict forms. The historical conditions are altered more than once during the life of an ethnos. Conversely, divergence of ethnoi is often observed during the predominance of one mode of production. Starting from Marx's idea of the historical process as an interaction of the history of nature and the history of men, footnote 20, we can propose a first, most general division into social stimuli arising in the technosphere, and natural stimuli constantly operating from the geographical environment. Everyone is not only a member of some society or other that is at a certain level of development, but is also a physical body subject to gravitation, and the final link in some biokinosis, an organism capable of adaptation and existing at an age determined by the effect of hormones. The same can be said about the long-living collectives that socially form class states or tribal unions of various character, social organisms, and in, nat in nature form ethnoi, tribes, nationalities, nations. Their non-coincidence is obvious. An ethnos is not a society. But there is another point of view, in accordance with which, quote, an ethnos is a socio-historical category whose genesis and development are determined, moreover, not by the biological laws of nature, but by the specific laws of the development of society. Footnote 21. How is that to be understood? According to the theory of historical materialism, the spontaneous development of the productive forces causes changes in the relations of production, which generates a dialectical process of class formation that are transformed by processes of class abolition. This is a global phenomenon, a peculiar social form of the development of matter. But what does that have to do with ethnogenesis? Surely the appearance of such well-known ethnoi as the French or English did not coincide chronologically or territorially with the molding of the feudal formation. 
Or did these ethnoid disappear with its collapse and the transition to capitalism? But in that same France, the socio-historical category, the Kingdom of France, already embraced in the 14th century, Celtic Bretons, Basques, Provençal, Burgundians, in addition to the French. So surely they were ethnoid. Doesn't this fact, one of very many, indicate that the pedigree definition is one-sided? And, so that is grounds for scientific dispute. Dialectical materialism distinguishes various forms of the motion of matter. The mechanical, physical, chemical, and biological are natural forms, while the social stands alone. And by virtue of its specific nature, it is characteristic only of mankind in all its manifestations. Every person and collective of people with technique and domesticated things tame animals and cultivated plants, is subject to the effect of both social and natural forms of the motion of matter, which are ceaselessly correlated in time, this is history, and space, this is geography. When we generalize the material in a single, complex, historical geography, amenable to observation and study, we have to examine it in two aspects, the social and the natural. In the first, we see social organizations, tribal unions, states, theocracies, political parties, philosophical schools, etc. In the second, ethnoi, i.e. collectives of people that arise and break up in a relatively short time, but each have an original structure, a unique stereotype of behavior, and its own rhythm of development, existing within the limits of homeostasis. It is accepted, of course, to call classes, for example, sometimes juridically registered in estates or castes, socio-historical categories. In pre-class society, tribal or genteel unions, for, exa for example, the Celtic clans, were their analog. In its broad sense, social category can be extended to stable institutions, the state, for example, or church organizations, the polis in Hellas, or the fife. But everyone who knows history is aware that such categories only coincide with the boundaries of ethnoi in very rare cases, i.e. there is no direct link here. And what is more, the economy, which belongs completely to the social form of the motion of matter, demolishes national boundaries. With the existence of a common European market, similar technique, similarity of education in the various countries, and widespread study of related languages, it might seem that the ethnic differences would be wiped out in 20th century Europe. But are they, in fact? The Irish broke away from Great Britain and spared no efforts to study their ancient, almost forgotten language. Scotland and Catalonia lay claim to autonomy, though they had hardly considered themselves oppressed for the past 300 years. In Belgium, Flanders, in Belgium, Flemings and Walloons, who lived in harmony until recently, have suddenly begun a violent struggle that has come to street fights between students of the two ethnoi. And since only chance coincidence of social and ethnic peaks and slumps were also observed in antiquity, it is obvious that we are observing an interference of two lines of development, or, in the language of mathematics, of two independent variables. This can only be ignored with a very strong desire to do so. Language. Let us try to discover the nature of the perceptible manifestation of the existence of ethnoi. The phenomenon of the counterposing of itself to all others, the we and the not us. What gives rise to this opposition and feeds it? Not unity of language, because there are many bilingual and trilingual ethnoi, and on the contrary, different ethnoi that speak one language. The French, for instance, speak four languages, French, Celtic, Basque, and Provençal, which does not prevent their present ethnic unity in spite of the history of the unification or rather the Parisian king's conquest of France from the Rhine to the Pyrenees having been quite bloody. On the other hand, the Mexicans, Peruvians, and Argentines speak Spanish, but are not Spaniards. For some reason, torrents of blood were spilled at the beginning of the 19th century, 
only in order for war-torn Latin America to fall into the hands of the trading companies of Great Britain and the USA. The Englishmen of Northumberland speak a language close to Norwegian because they are the descendants of Vikings who settled in England, and until recently the Irish knew only English but did not become English. Several different peoples speak Arabic. For many Uzbeks, their mother tongue is Tajik, and so on. In addition, there are group languages, like French in England in the 12th and 13th centuries, Greek in Parthia in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, Arabic in Persia from the 7th to 11th centuries AD, and so on. Since the integrity of the ethnic national group was not disrupted, one must conclude that it is not a matter of language. Furthermore, linguistic diversity often finds practical application the practice bringing people speaking different languages closer together. During the U.S.-Japanese War in the Pacific, for example, the Japanese, Japanese succeeded so well in decoding American radio transitions that the Americans lost the possibility of transmitting secret information by radio. But they found a clever, unexpected way out by teaching the Morse code to called up Indians. An Apache transmitted to a Navajo in Athabascan, an Assiniboine to a Sioux in Dakota, and the receiver translated the text into English. The Japanese broke the code, but were helpless in face of the texts. Military service often brings people together. The Indians who returned home remained friends with their pale-faced war comrades. It did not, however, assimilate the Indians. The command, moreover, valued precisely their ethnic features, including bilingualism. So although language may serve as an indicator of ethnic community in separate cases, it is not the cause of it. The Weps, Udmurts, Karelians, and Chuvash, let us know, still, still speak their own languages at home, but study Russian in school, and on quitting their villages are practically indistinguishable from Russians. Their knowledge of their native language does not in the least prevent them from working on a common footing. Finally, the Ottoman Turks. In the 13th century, the Turkmenian chieftain Orthrogul, escaping from the Mongols, led around 500 horsemen and their families into Asia Minor. The Sultan of Iconium settled the arrivals in Bursa, on the border with Nicaea, to wage a border war with the infidel Greeks. Under the first sultans, volunteer Ghazi gathered in Bursa from all over the Near East, attracted by the allure of booty and land for settlement. They constituted cavalry, the Spahis. The conquest of Bulgaria and Macedonia in the 14th century enabled the Turkish sultans to organize infantry from the Christian boys who were torn from their families, converted to Islam, trained for warfare, and given the status of guards the new troops, or Janissaries. In the 15th century, a navy was created, manned by all the adventurists of the coasts of the Mediterranean. In the 16th century, light cavalry, Akinji, were added, formed from the emigrants from the conquered Diyar Bakr, Iraq, and Kurdistan. French renegades became diplomats, and Greeks, Armenians, and Jews, the financiers and economists. These people bought wives in the slave markets. Poles, Ukrainians, Germans, Italians, Georgian, Greeks, Berbers, Negroes, etc. These women were the mothers and grandmothers of the Turkish troops. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the Turks were an ethnos, but the young soldier received orders in Turkish, talked with his mother in Polish and his grandmother in Italian, traded in the bazaar in Greek, read verses in Persian, and prayed in Arabic. But he was an Ottoman because he behaved as an Ottoman did, a brave, pious warrior of Islam. The numerous European renegades broke down this unity in the 19th century and formed the Young Turks in Paris. In the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire fell, and the ethnos broke up. People passed into other ethnoi. The descendants of the Seljuks raised a new Turkey from the depths of Asia Minor, and the remnants of the Ottomans lived out their remaining days in the alleys of Istanbul. So, a religious community, not a linguistic one, united the Ottoman ethnos for 600 years.
Ideology and culture are sometimes also attributes, but not necessary ones. Only an Orthodox Christian could be a Byzantine, for example, and all Orthodox were considered subjects of the Constantinople Emperor and perceived as ours. But that was disrupted as soon as the baptized Bulgars started war with the Greeks, while Rus, having adopted Orthodoxy, did not dream of submitting to Tsargrad. The principle of like-mindedness was also proclaimed by the Caliphs, the successors of Muhammad, but it did not withstand the rivalry of living reality. Ethnoi again arose within the unity of Islam. On the other hand, preaching sometimes unites a group of people, which becomes an ethnos, the Sikhs in northwest India, for example, and the Ottoman Turks, see above. But in the Ottoman Empire, there were Sunni Muslims, the subjects of the Sultan, Arabs, and Crimean Tatars, who did not, however, consider themselves Turks. Even linguistic closeness to the Ottomans played no role for the Tatars. So, faith, too, is not a common attribute of ethnicity. A clear example of the confessional self-awareness of an ethnos is the Sikhs, a sect of Indian origin. The caste system established in India was considered obligatory for all Hindus. It was a special structure of the ethnos. Being a Hindu meant being a member of a definite caste. It was not a political unity, but the stereotype of behavior was firmly maintained, even quite brutally. Each caste had the right to a certain type of occupation, and those on whom military service was settled were few. That made it possible for Afghan Muslims to master India and jeer at the defenseless population, the inhabitants of Punjab suffering most. In the 16th century, a teaching appeared that at first proclaimed non-resistance to evil, but later set an aim of war against the Muslims. The caste system was abolished, which distinguished Sikhs, the name of the devotees of the new faith, from Hindus. They isolated themselves from the Indian community by endogamy, developed their own stereotype of behavior, and established a structure of their own community. According to the principle I have adopted, Sikhs should be regarded as a rising ethnos counterposed to Hindus, and so they perceive themselves. The religious conception has become a symbol for them, and for us, an indicator of ethnic divergence. The teaching of the Sikhs cannot be considered just a doctrine, because if anyone in Moscow were to embrace this religion, he would not become a Sikh and they would not consider him one of them. The Sikhs became an ethnos on the basis of religion, the Mongols on the basis of kinship, the Swiss through a successful war against the Austrian feudalists, who welded together a country where four languages were spoken. Ethnoi are formed by various means, and our task is to find the common pattern in that. Most major peoples have several ethnographic types that constitute a harmonious system, but that differ very much from one another, both in time and in social structure. Compare 17th century Moscow with its boyar hats and beards, where women spun mica windows, spun behind mica windows, or 18th century Moscow where magnates in wigs and camisoles took their wives to balls, and 19th century Moscow when bearded nihilist students educated young ladies from all estates, and add the descendants of the 20th century. Comparing them with all with our age, knowing that they are one and the same ethnos, we see that ethnography could lead the investigator, without knowledge of history, into error. No less indicative is a spatial cross-section for one year, say 1869. White Sea Russians, Petersburg workers, Transvolga Old Believers, Siberian gold prospectors, peasants of the forest provinces and peasants of the steppes, the Don and Ural Cossacks, were outwardly quite unlike one another, but that did not disrupt the folk unity, while the closeness of the everyday life of the Graben Cossacks and the Chechens did not unite them. Strange as it may be, the point of view put forward here has met active resistance precisely where it should attract attention. Kozlov and Pokshishevsky, whose paper I cited above, have opposed their view to mine on the relationship of ethnography and geography and on the history of the question, i.e. on historiography. While not desiring to pol polemize, 
polemicize, I nevertheless cannot ignore another conception that lays claims without grounds to canonicity. That would be academically incorrect. These scholars represent the formation of ethnography as a science as follows. Up to the middle of the 19th century, geography and ethnography developed together, but ethnography later split into socio-historical and geographical trends. Lewis Morgan, J.J. Bachhofen, E.B. Taylor, e. Tyler, Sir James Fraser, and Ilya Sternberg belong to the first trend, and Friedrich Retzel, L.D. Sinitsky, A.A. Kubert, and the French School of Human Geography to the second. There is a substantial defect in the classification proposed, which reduces it essentially to naught. The members of the trends were interested in different subjects and devoted their attention to different themes. And that being the case, it is unjustified to counterpose them. For when Retzel tried to substantiate the geographical character of ethnographic division into districts, he by no means disputed the conception of animism, sympathetic magic, or ritual murder of a priest, i.e. the subjects to which Fraser devoted his golden bow. But it was to the existence of versatile scholars' diverse interests that the authors ascribed the separation of ethnography from geography and its rebirth as a social science. There was a certain confusion in that fraught with sorry consequences, and science develops by broadening its range of investigation and not by a simple change of thematic. Consequently, when historical aspects were added to the achievements of geographical ethnography, that was progress of the science. But when some subjects were replaced by others, that was marking time, which is always extremely damaging. Equally, one must not replace ethnography by a theory about economic cultural types, characteristic of peoples that are approximately at an identical level of socioeconomic development and living in similar natural geographic conditions. For example, the type of, quote, Arctic marine mammal hunters, unquote, quote, herdsmen of the steppes, and so on. Footnote 22. This trend is fruitful for paleoeconomic geography, but does not and cannot have any relation to ethnography. There are, for example, reindeer chuchki, i.e. pastoralists, and the chuchki hunters of marine mammals, and so on. According to the classification proposed, they should be put into different groups, although they are one ethnos. And surely the Russian peasants of Muscovy, the White Sea Russians, Pomors, and Siberian sable hunters are one ethnos, and there is indeed no end of examples. It is also incorrect to equate ethnos with biological taxonomic units, i.e. races or populations. Races differ from one another in physical attributes that have no essential significance for man's life activity, footnote 23. A population is an aggregate of individuals peopling a definite territory in which they freely crossbreed and are separated from neighboring populations by isolation of some sort. An ethnos, in my understanding, is a collective of individuals that has a unique inner structure and an original stereotype of behavior, both components being dynamic. Consequently, an ethnos is an elementary phenomenon that is not reducible to either sociological, biological, or geographical phenomena. Reductions of ethnogenesis to linguistic cultural processes distorts reality, removing the complexity of ethnic history, which Bromley pointed out when he proposed introducing the supplementary terms ethnikos and iso, ethnosocial organization, in order to clarify the problem. Footnote 24. I believe one can be, cannot be satisfied with his solution, but it is incorrect to ignore it altogether. Descent from a single ancestor. In ancient times, such descent was considered obligatory for an ethnos. Often an animal, which was not always a totem, figured as the ancestor. For the Turks and the Romans, it was a she-wolf wet nurse. For the Agurs, a wolf that fertilized a queen. For the Tibetans, an ape and a female Rakshas, a forest demon. But usually, it was a man whose image was distorted beyond recognition by legend. Abraham, the ancestor of the Jews, his son Ismail, 
the ancestor of the Arabs, Cadmus, the founder of Thebes and initiator of the Boeotians, and so on. Strange as it may seem, these archaic views have not died out. Only in our time, we try to put some ancient tribe in place of the person, as the ancestors of an existing ethnos. But that too is incorrect. As there is no person who has only a father or a mother, so there is no ethnos that has not been produced by various ancestors. And one should not confuse ethnoi with races, as is often done, but without justification. The grounds for temptation is the preconceived idea that the processes of racial origin, like the processes of ethnogenesis, probably derived in certain areas of the world and were governed by the specific nature of the natural phenomena, footnote 25, i.e. by the climate, flora, and fauna of geographical zones. There is an impermissible substitution of an object here i.e. the initial race, is arbitrarily equated with the ethnos. Let us examine this. During the Upper Paleolithic, when subarctic conditions prevailed in Europe with a very arid climate, the valley of the Rhone was settled by the Grimaldi Negroid race, while the tropical forests of Africa were inhabited by the Khoisan race, which combined Mongoloid and Negroid features. This race was ancient. Its origin is unclear, but there are no grounds for considering it a hybrid. The Negroid Bantu pushed the Khoisan to the extreme south of Africa in a quite historical period beginning in the 1st century AD up to the 19th century, when the Bechuana drove the Bushmen into the Kalahari Desert. Negroid features did not arise at all in equatorial America, although the natural conditions were similar to the African. The arid zone of Eurasia was peopled by Europeoids of the Cro-Magnon type and by Mongoloids, but that did not lead to a wiping out of racial features. In Tibet, the Mongoloid Bod, Bodul, were neighbors of the Europeoid Dardi and Pamertsi, and in the Himalayas of the Gurkhas and of the Patani. But the similarity of natural environment did not influence the racial character. In short, one must recognize that the functional connection of anthropological differences among various populations and the geographical conditions of the areas peopled by them is not clear. Furthermore, there is no certainty that there is one general in nature, the more so that the idea runs counter to the achievements of modern paleoanthropology, which bases racial classifications not on zones of latitude, but by meridional regions, Atlantic, to which Europeoids and African Negroids are assigned, and Pacific, to which the Mongoloids of East Asia and America belong. This point of view, point of view rules out the effect of natural conditions on the origin of races because both groups took shape in various climatic zones. Ethnoi are always linked, on the contrary, with natural conditions through active economic activity, which is manifested in two directions, adaptation to the terrain and of the latter to an ethnos. In both cases, however, we come up against an ethnos as a really existing phenomenon, although the reason for its origin is not clear. It is also not necessary to reduce the whole diversity of my theme to some one thing. It is better simply to establish the role of certain factors. The terrain, for instance, determines an ethnic collective's possibilities during its rise, but a newly born ethnos alters the terrain in accordance with its requirements. Such mutual adaptation is only possible when a rising ethnos is full of strength and is seeking to apply it. Later, however, it becomes used to the established situation, which becomes near and dear to its descendants. Denial of that leads inevitably to a conclusion that peoples have no homeland understood here as a combination of topographical elements dear to all hearts. Hardly anyone will agree with that. That alone indicates that ethnogenesis is not a social process because spontaneous development of the sociosphere only interacts with natural phenomena but is not a product of them. But it is precisely because ethnogenesis is a process and a directly observed ethnos is a phase of ethnogenesis and consequently an unstable system, that any comparison of ethnoi with anthropological races is ruled out, and so with any racial theories.
In fact, the principle of anthropological classification is similarity, and the people who comprise an ethnos are diverse. Two or more components always operate during an ethnogenesis. The crossing of various ethnoi sometimes yields a new stable form, but sometimes leads to degeneration. A mix of Slavs, Ugrians, Alans, and Turks merged into the great Russian nationality while the Mongolo-Chinese and Manchurian Chinese mixtures that often took shape along the line of the Great Wall over the last 2,000 years proved unstable and disappeared and did not form independent ethnic units. Central Asia was inhabited by Sogdians in the 7th century AD, and the term Tajik already meant Arab in the 8th century, i.e. warriors of the Caliph. Nasser ibn Sayyar, when suppressing a rising of Sogdians in A.D. 733, was forced to recruit Khorasani Persians, who had already adopted Islam, to his depleted forces. He picked many of them, so that the Persians began to predominate in his Arab army. After his victory, when the Sogdian men were being slaughtered and the children sold into slavery, but the beautiful women and flourishing gardens were shared out among the victors. A Persian-speaking population developed in Sogdiana and Bukhara, that resembled the Khorasanis. But in 1510, the fates of Iran and Central Asia diverged. The Turk Ismail Safavi, a religious Shiite, conquered Iran and converted the Persians to Shiism. But Central Asia fell to the Sunni Uzbeks, and the Persian-speaking population retained the old name Tajik, which, before the fall of the Bukharan dynasty of the Mangits in 1918, had no significance attached to it. When the Uzbek and Tajik republics were formed from the old Turkestan territory, the descendants of the Khorasani Persians, the 8th century conquerors who lived in Bukhara and Samarkand, were counted as Uzbeks in the census, and the descendants of the Turks, the conquerors of the 11th and 16th centuries, living in Dushanbe and Chakrabaz, as Tajiks. They knew both languages from childhood, were Muslims, and were indifferent to how they were recorded. Over the past 40 years, their position has altered. Tajiks and Uzbeks have been formed as socialist nations. But how were they to be regarded before then, when religious affiliation determined ethnic affiliation, Muslims and Kafirs, and there were no clans among Tajiks? For both ethnic substrata, Turks and Iranians, were imported ethnoi into Central Asia a thousand years ago, quite a long enough period for adaptation. There is obviously a certain pattern here that needs to be brought out and described. But clearly, community of origin cannot be the indicator for determination of an ethnos. It is a myth inherited by our consciousness from the primitive science of primitive society. Ethnos as an illusion. But perhaps ethnos is simply a social category that takes shape with the formation of a society, footnote 26. Then ethnos is an illusory value and ethnography a meaningless pastime, since it is simpler to study social conditions directly. That point of view is mistaken, however, which becomes obvious when speculation is replaced by observations of natural processes accessible to a thoughtful person. Let me clarify this from real examples. Celtic Britons and Iberian Gascons live in France. In the forest of the Vendée and on the slopes of the Pyrenees, they dress in their own costumes, speak their own language, and distinguish themselves distinctly in their homelands from the French. But can one say of Marshal Murat or Lon that they were Basques and not French? or about D'Artagnan, both as a historical personage and the hero of Dumas' novel? Can we not consider the Breton nobleman Chateaubriand and Guy de Retz, the companion of Joan of Arc, Frenchman? Wasn't the Irish Oscar Wilde not an English writer? The famous Orientalist Chokhan Valikhanov said of him, said of himself that he considered himself equally Russian and Kazakh. There is not Uh, There's any number of such examples, but they all show that the ethnic affiliation discoverable in people's consciousness is not a product of consciousness itself. It evidently reflects some aspect or other of the person, much deeper, and external as regards consciousness, by which I understand a form of higher nervous activity. 
but in other cases, ethnoi, for some reason, manifest immense resistance to the effects of their surroundings and do not assimilate. The gypsies have now been separated from their society in India for a thousand years, have lost their link with their native land, and nevertheless have not merged with the Spaniards or the French or the Czechs or the Mongols. They did not adopt the feudal institutions of the societies of Europe, remaining an outsider group in all the countries where they lived. The Iroquois still live as a tiny ethnic group, totaling some 20,000 persons, surrounded by hypertrophied capitalism, but do not adopt the, quote, American way of life, unquote. In the Mongolian People's Republic, there are Turkic ethnoi, Soyots or Urukatsi, Kazakhs, etc., but in spite of a similarity of the material and spiritual development of society, they have not merged with the Mongols, but constitute an independent ethnoi. And conversely, French settled in Canada in the 18th century and still retain their ethnic face. Jews lived in Salonika as an endogamous group for more than 400 years after their expulsion from Spain, but according to the data of 1918, they were more like Arabs than their neighbors the Greeks. Exactly the same way Germans from Hungary outwardly resemble their confreres in Germany and Gypsies Hindus. Selection alters the correlation of attributes slowly, and mutations we know are rare. Any nationality living in a terrain customary for it is therefore almost in a state of equilibrium. But we must not think that a change of conditions of existence never influences an ethnos. Sometimes it exerts such a strong impact that new attributes are formed and new ethnic variants that are more or less stable. We must therefore examine how these processes come about and why they yield different results. Between East and West When we acquaint ourselves with the cultures of the Mediterranean, we find ourselves in an environment of accustomed concepts and values. Religion signifies belief in God. The state is a territory with a definite order and authority. Countries have names, peoples and ethnic affiliation, and rivers and lakes are in definite places. Only the customary titles West and East do not have quite geographic do not behave quite geographically. Morocco is considered east, and Hungary and Poland west. But everyone manages to adapt to this convention, and there is no confusion of the concepts. Non-specialist familiarity with a subject as a consequence of reading fiction and the availability of living tradition are very conducive to this. But as soon as we cross the mountain passes that divide Central and Eastern Asia, we come into a world of another system of reckoning. Here, we meet religions that deny the existence not only of a divinity, but also of the world around us. Regimes and social structures prove to contradict the principle of the state and authority. We find ethnoi in nameless countries, without a community of language and economy, and sometimes even of territory, while rivers and lakes will migrate like pastoralists. The tribes that we are accustomed to consider nomads prove to be settled, and the strength of armies will not depend on their numbers. Only the pattern of ethnogenesis remains unchanged. Other material calls for another approach, and consequently another scale of investigation. Otherwise, it will remain incomprehensible, and my book will become unnecessary for the reader. That is to say, the reader accustomed to European terms. He knows what a king is, an account, or an earl, a chancellor, and a bourgeois commune. But in the east of Akumeni, there were not equivalent terms. A Kagan was not a king or an emperor, but a military chieftain elected for life, who combined with it the performance of rituals of honoring ancestors. But can we imagine Richard the Lionheart saying a funerary mass for Henry II, whom he drove to heart failure? And even that members of the Gascon English nobility were present at this mass? Indeed, it is nonsense, but in the east of the great steppes he would have been obliged to do so, otherwise he would have been killed. Such appellations as Chinese or Hindus are not equivalent to the French or Germans, but to West Europeans as a whole, because they are systems of ethnoi, but united on other principles of culture. 
Hindus are linked by a system of castes, and Chinese by hieroglyphic writing and an education connected with it. As soon as a native of Hindustan was converted to Mohammedanism, he ceased to be a Hindu, since he became an outcast or renegade for his fellow countrymen and fell into the category of untouchables. And as a Chinese living among barbarians, according to their customs, was treated, according to Confucius, as a barbarian. But a foreigner who observed Chinese etiquette was regarded as a Chinese. In order to compare the ethnoi of East and West, we have to find a proper correlation with an equal scale of division. For that purpose, I shall study the properties of an ethnos as a natural phenomenon characteristic of all countries and ages. To achieve this purpose, one must be very attentive to the ancient traditional information about the world, and not to reject it in advance because it does not correspond to our modern notions and ideas. We constantly forget that people who have lived several thousand years ago had the same consciousness, capacities, and aspiration for the truth and knowledge as modern people. Treatises that have come down to us from the various peoples of various times testify to that. The ordinary approach is not suitable for understanding the history and culture of Eastern Asia. When we approach the study of the history of Europe, we can divide it up into the history of France, Germany, England, etc., or ancient history, medieval, and modern. Then, studying, say, the history of Rome, we are interested in neighboring peoples only insofar as Rome clashed with them. For Western countries, such an approach is justified by the results obtained, but when we study Central Asia by this means, we do not get satisfactory results. The reason lies deep. It is that the Asian and European understanding of the term people or folk is different. In Asia, the ethnic unity is perceived differently, even if I take off the Levant and India with Indochina, as without any direct relation to my theme, there remain all the same three different understandings, the Chinese, Iranian, and nomadic. The last named, moreover, varies particularly strongly with the epoch. In Europe, an ethnonym is a stable concept. In Central Asia, it is more or less fluid. In China, it is absorbent, and in Iran, exclusive. In other words, in order to be considered a Chinese in China, a person has to adopt the fundamentals of Chinese morality, education, and rules of behavior. Origin was not taken into account nor language because the Chinese spoke different languages in antiquity. It is therefore clear that China inevitably expanded, swallowing and absorbing small peoples and tribes. In Iran, on the contrary, a Persian had to be born one, but above all, in addition, had to honor Ahura Mazda and hate Ahriman. Without that, it was impossible to be an Aryan. The medieval or Sassanid Persians did not think it even possible to include anyone in their ranks since they called themselves well-born or noble, nondoron, and others did not belong to that number. As a result, the number of the people steadily fell. It is difficult to guess at the Parthian conception, but it seemingly differed from the Persian only in being rather broader. With the honey, it was necessary, in order to be considered one, to be a member of a clan. But a clan could be joined through marriage or by the command of a shanui, by which a person became a member of a clan. The heirs of the honey, the Tyrians, began to incorporate whole tribes. Mixed tribal alliances arose on the basis of acceptance, for example, Kazakhs, Yakuts, etc. Among the Mongols, very close in general to the Turks and Hani, the horde was given predominance i.e. a group of people united by discipline and leadership. Neither origin nor language nor religious beliefs was required for that, but only courage and readiness to submit. The names of the hordes were clearly not ethnonyms, but the existence of, of hordes, but with the existence of hordes, ethnonyms fell out of use in general, since there was no need for them. The concept of people coincided with that of state. In that connection, we have firmly to remember that the concept of state differs in all the cases mentioned above, and it is not intertranslatable. The Chinese guo is represented by a hieroglyph, 
an enclosure, and a man with a spear. A man with a spear. That does not by any means correspond to the English state or the French etat, even the Latin imperium and res publica. It is also remote in content from the Iranian Shah and the above-mentioned horde. The nuances of the difference often prove more significant than the elements of similarity, and that determines the behavior of the figures of history. What seems monstrous to a European is natural for a Mongol, and vice versa. We cannot help regretting, of course, the widespread idea that all state forms, social institutions, ethnic norms, and even manners of expositions not like the European are simply backward, imperfect, and defective. Banal Eurocentrism is sufficient for Philistine perception, but not suitable for scientific comprehension of the diversity of the observed social phenomena. For, from the standpoint of a Chinese or an Arab, West Europeans seem to be defective. And that is also incorrect, untrue, and unpromising for history. We obviously have to find a system of reckoning by which all observations will be made with an equal degree of accuracy. Only such an approach will make it possible to compare dissimilar phenomena and so yield reliable conclusions. In the West, countries are distinguished by the name, but in the East, a country and people without a name. Between the eastern boundary of the Muslim world and the northwestern outskirts of the Middle Kingdom, which we call China, lies a country that has no definite name. That is all the more strange, since its geographical frontiers are very exactly delineated. The physical and climatic conditions within it are original and unique, the population numerous and long concerned with culture. The country was very well known to Chinese, Greek, and Arab geographers. It was visited by Russian and West European travelers. Archaeological excavations have been carried out in it many times. And everyone called it descriptively some way or other, but it did not have a name of its own. We therefore only know where it was located. Two mountain ranges stretch eastward from the Pamirs, the Kunlun Shan, to the south of which lies Tibet, and the Tian Shan. Between these mountain ranges lies a sandy desert, the Takla Makan, intersected by the river Tarim. This river has neither source nor mouth. Its beginning is taken to be the Aral, i.e. the island between the two branches of the three rivers, the Yarkand, the Aksu, and, and the Khotan. Its end is sometime lost in the sands and gets to the lake Karaburankul and sometimes fills Lop Nor a lake that constantly changes place, footnote 27. In this strange country, the rivers and lakes wander, and people huddle in the mountain foothills. Fresh brooks flow down from the mountains, but then and there disappear under heaps of scree, and come out on the surface at a considerable distance from the ridges. There are oases there. Then the rivers again disappear, this time into the sands. In this very continental country, there is a very deep depression, the bottom of which lies 154 meters below sea level, and in this depression there is an ancient cultural center, the Turfan Oasis. How were sciences and the arts studied there in the summer heat as high as 48 degrees Celsius and winter frosts as low as negative 37 degrees Celsius, in the unbelievable dryness of the autumn air and the strong spring winds? Yet they were and with no little success. The ancient population of this country had no name for itself. It is accepted now to call these people Tokarians, but that is not an ethnonym, but a Tibetan sobriquet, Thagar, which means whitehead or blonde. The inhabitants of these various oases spoke various languages of the Indo-European group, including even a West Aryan one, unlike those known in Europe. In the southwest of the country, in the foothills, foothills of the Kunlun Shan, roamed Tibetan tribes that were in close contact with the inhabitants of Khotan and Yarkand, but did not mix with them. In the early centuries A.D., Sakas penetrated this country from the west, who settled the south of Kashgar as far as Khotan. 
and Chinese immigrants escaping the terrors of civil wars. The Chinese built themselves a colony, Gaochang, in the Turfan Oasis, which lasted until the 9th century AD and disappeared without a trace. As you will see, it is impossible to choose a name for this country by ethnonym, but this was a cultured population which organized an economy that must be considered the best in the ancient world. The nature of the oases of Central Asia brought into harmony with the needs of man. The Trifon people assimilated the Iranian system of underground water supply, Kariz, thanks to which the irrigated area fed a big population. Two harvests a year were gathered. Turfan grapes can rightly be considered the best in the world. There were watermelons, melons, and apricots from spring to late autumn. The sowings of long fiber cotton were protected by the winds, protected from the winds by Lombardy poplars and mulberry trees. And around was a stony desert of fragments of disintegrated rocks, shingle, and boulders, through which neither shrub nor tree penetrated. This was a reliable defense of the oasis against big armies. It was very difficult to send foot soldiers across the desert because they had to carry not only food with them, but also water, which greatly increased the baggage train. And the raids of the nomads' light cavalry were not terrible for the fortress walls. A second large, city, large center of this country, Karashar, lay in the hills around the freshwater lake Bagrash Kul. This town, quote, has rich lands, abounds in fish, it is well fortified by nature, and is easily defended, footnote 28, unquote. From Bagrash Kul flows the Kanchi Darya, which feeds Lopnor. The full-flowing Tarim River, bordered by groves of poplars, tamarisks, sea buckthorn, and tall reeds that give cover to deer and wild boars, can be reached along its banks without suffering thirst. The old ideology of the settled dwellers of this country was Buddhism in the Hinayana form, lesser vehicle, lesser way, i.e. the most orthodox teaching of the Buddha without admixtures, which it is impossible to call a religion. The Hinayanists deny God, putting the moral law of karma, causal succession, in his place. A Buddha is a man who has achieved perfection and is an example for anybody wishing to liberate himself from sufferings and rebirths through the achievement of nirvana, the state of absolute peace. Only a purposeful person, or arhat, a holy man, could achieve it, without depending either on divine mercy or on outside help. It goes without saying that achieving, that achieving the path of perfection is the affair of the few. But what are the rest to do? They simply concern themselves with everyday affairs, respect the arhats, listen to sermons in their spare time, and hope that they themselves might, in future rebirths, become holy ascetics. But we have already seen, by way of other examples, how insignificantly dogmas influence the ethnic stereotype of behavior. The Arhats, merchants, soldiers, and farmers of Tirfan, Karashar, and Kucha constituted a single system for which Hinayana Buddhism was only a coloring. The coloring of an object plays its role, however, and sometimes an essential one. The Hinayana community lasted until the 15th century, but the Mahayana, also a Buddhist doctrine, but a vague, complicated one of different character which spread in Yarkand and Khotan, obviously not accidentally, had already given way to Islam in the 11th century. The Uyghurs who arrived in Turfan professed Manichaeanism, but seemingly as formally as the Turfanites professed Buddhism. Manichaeanism had already disappeared as an independent confession before the 12th century, but Manichaean ideas passed into certain Buddhist philosophical currents and into Nestorianism, which made a victorious march throughout Central Asia in the 11th century. And in those centuries, the inhabitants of Turfan, Karashar, and Kucha began to call themselves Agurs. The Nestorians in Agoria got along with the Buddhists in spite of their inherent intolerance. Christianity was seemingly welcome to a people of a religious mentality remote from the atheistic abstractions of Hinayana. The merchants also became Christians, because the Buddhist doctrine forbade, quote, those who have taken the path, quote, to touch gold, silver, and women. 
religious people who were actively involved in economic life were therefore compelled to seek a faith that did not prevent them from living and working. One can consequently conclude that convenient ecological niches were found for both ideological systems. The wealth of this country was mainly based on a favorable geographic position. Two caravan routes passed across it, one north of the Tian Shan and the other south of the Tian Shan. Chinese silk flowed by these routes to, Pro to Provence and luxury articles of France and Byzantium to China. The caravaneers rested in the oases from their arduous desert crossings and fattened their camels and horses. In that connection, the local women widely practiced the first and oldest profession, while the husbands permitted their wives these earnings, part of which went into their pockets. The Agurs were so accustomed to this that even when, thanks to alliance with the Mongols, Oguria became fabulously rich, its inhabitants begged the Mongol Khan not to forbid their wives to entertain travelers. Footnote 29. This custom, or more correctly, element of the ethnic stereotype of behavior, proved more stable than language, religion, political system, and even their own name. The stereotype of behavior developed as an adaptive attribute, i.e. as a mode of adaptation of the ethnos to its geographical environment. The names changed here more often than the ethnoi bearing them, the change of ethnonyms being explained by the political climate. The rich, numerous population of these fertile oases could, without difficulty, feed the warlike nomads, the more so that the Uyghurs and later the Mongols took on themselves the defense of their subjects against foreign enemies. For 300 years, the Uyghurs mixed with the Aborigines, but forced them to change from the Tocharian language to Turkish. That did not need much effort, incidentally, because in the 11th century, all the peoples from the azure waters of the Sea of Marmara and the forested slope of the Carpathians to the jungles of Bengal and the Great Wall of China spoke dialects of the Turkish language. Such a broad distribution of Turkish speaking made this language convenient for trading operations, and the inhabitants of the oases of both halves of Central Asia were identically fond of trading. Change of a native but little used language for a generally accepted one therefore happened without difficulty, not only in the northeast of the Tarim Basin, but also in the southwest, where the role of the Uyghurs had been taken on by the Turkish Yagma and Karluk tribes. But the difference between them and the Uyghurs was immense. The Uyghurs did not affect the way of life, religion, or culture of their subjects, but the Karluks, who had adopted Islam in A.D. 960, converted the Yashgar, Yarkand, and Khotan oases into likenesses of Samarkand and Bukhara. A geographically monolithic region thus proved to be divided into two ethnocultural provinces by no means friendly to one another. But the forces were balanced, and the distances between the oases were vast and almost impassable, the position, therefore, became stabilized for a long time. This situation explains why the country remained without a single name. In antiquity, the Chinese called it Ziyu, i.e., the Western Territory, and considered its end to be the Bow Mountains, the Pamers and Altai. The Hellenes called this land Serica, and the precious commodity obtained from it, Sericos, silk. I shall not bother to explain the etymology of this word. In modern times, the conventional names have also been used Kashgaria, East Turkestan, Sinkiang, i.e. literally the new frontier established by the Manchurians in the 18th century. None of these names are suitable for our times. What was the West for the ancient Chinese became the middle in the 12th and 13th centuries. To call a country inhabited by Indo-Europeans who have learned to understand Turkish speech, Turkestan, is stupid. Kashgar never became the capital, and the new frontier did not seem to even be the horizon. Best of all, we are left with the geographical convention name, the Tarim Basin. The river is a reliable reference point, in any case neutral and lasting. 
In addition, the term Sin Kang also includes Jungaria, also a conventional and later name, located north of the Tian Shan, which had a quite different historical fate. The eastern boundary of Oguria is difficult to define. Since the disappearance of the river, it has shifted significantly, and many of the changes have not been dated. It can be thought that the Hami oasis belonged to the Agurs and perhaps to the cave town of Tunhuang, a treasure house of Buddhist art. But the more eastern lands, the oases of the Nanshan Mountains, Nanshan foothills rather, were taken from the Agurs by the Tangits. These were a people which, like the Agurs, do not now exist, although there are people who call themselves such. But that, too, is a mirage. The people calling themselves Ugurs are Fergana Turks who settled in the east in the 15th to 18th centuries. And those who are taken for Tangits are nomadic Tibetans, a relic ethnos who were once the most savage enemies of the Tangits. So, a historical critique shows that the meaning of name and the sound of it do not always correspond in Asia. In order to avoid annoying and, alas, frequent mistakes, one must develop a system of reckoning that would be real for Europe and Asia and America, Oceania, Africa, and Australia. But in this system, sense will be preferred to phonetics, i.e. it will be based on history rather than on linguistics. States and Processes The aggregate of adduced facts indicates that the system of reference taking socioeconomic formations as its basis does not apply in principle to ethnogenesis. This system fixes states of society determined by the mode of production, which in turn depends on the level of productive forces, in other words, on technosphere. This system of reference is very convenient for studying the history of material culture state institutions, styles in art, philosophical schools, in short, for everything created by people. It has become so customary over the past century that it has been mechanically transferred to the analysis of ethnogenesis. The concept state has its place both in, both in nature and in society. In nature, there are four states, solid, liquid, gaseous, and plasma. The transition of a molecule of inanimate matter from one state to another occurs through a certain expenditure of energy. The latent heat of melting or the generation of steam, i.e. a small jump, and the process is reversible. In the live matter of the biosphere, this transition is linked with the death of the organism and is irreversible. That can mean there are only two states, life and death, for an organism. But since death is annihilation and the organism as an, of the organism as an entity, it is ridiculous to call this moment of transition a state. For an organism's life, it too is not a state but a process. From the birth through an acme form in which there is reproduction to death. The analogy of the process of life in inanimate matter is the crystallization of minerals and their subsequent metamorphosis into amorphous masses. When studying states and processes, we always employ different methods. For states, it is classification by any conventionally accepted principle convenient for surveying the phenomenon as a whole. For processes, particularly linked with evolution or the formation of species, systematics is needed, based on a hierarchical principle, i.e. the correlation of similar, although not identical, groups of different rank, such as Linnaeus's systematics perfected by Darwin. The hierarchical character of the system of the organic world is governed by the course and character of evolutionary processes, inseparable from life and obligatory for it. But as soon as life dies, a state arises, more or less rapidly broken up by the action of the environment, although the latter is constituted by other dead states, also subject to irreversible deformation. For an organism, including the human organism, 
Of course, there's only one mode of reaching a state, to become a mummy, and for an ethnos, to become an archaeological culture. It is otherwise with the technosphere and the relations of productions associated with it. In it, there are states. It is easy to make scrap of a tractor and a tractor from scrap. Only expenditure of a certain, alas, not small, amount of energy is required. There are also states in social life. They used to be called estates. In a metaphorical sense, one can call class affiliation a state, but it must be remembered that it is the product of relations of production and of the productive forces, i.e. also of the technosphere. This state is extremely unstable. Warrior, a warrior taken prisoner, became a slave, but having run away, could become a feudal lord. There is no place or need for the hierarchical principle in the fate of such a person. Simple recording is sufficient. Changes of social states are similar, though not identical. For instance, to changes of natural states, they are reversible and require, for passage from one state to another, an investment of additional energy. But what is an ethnos? Can one, by making an effort, change one's ethnic affiliation? Seemingly not. But that already indicates that an ethnos is not a state but a process. A second argument against the con conception of state is the erosion of boundaries between ethnoi and zones of ethnic contacts. If the change of a social state is, as a rule, a once and for all act, for example, the ennobling of the gentry, demotion to the ranks, sale into slavery, emancipation from bondage, etc., the mixing of peoples in the valley of the Huang Ho or in Constantinople or in North America is always a painful, long, and extremely variable process in the sense that the results of interbreeding often prove unexpected and are always uncontrollable. This is due mainly to the absence of a developed ethnological theory that would make it possible to act with due allowance for the consequences of one's actions and not blindly.